tonight on Nate Newswatch. While other post-secondary institutes are taking their fall break next week, Nate's students and staff will be in class. It stops the momentum of the learning that's taking place. We take a look at how some students participated in Remembrance Day ceremonies leading up to Sunday. I think it's nice to remember the people who fought for us. And we meet Edmonton's new incoming police chief. We're going to change the crime rate in the city of Edmonton. We need to take it personal. Newswatch starts now. Good evening. This time of year is one of the busiest for post-secondary students. Because of this, many schools have a fall break. However, Nate does not. Our Libby Dirks joins us live from the South Lobby with more on this story. Thanks. It's that time of year again where many schools, such as the University of Alberta and McEwen University, gives their students a break. And although Nate does have a reading week in the winter semester, they do not have one in the fall semester. The 2018 fall semester here at Nate provided staff and students with only one day off from school, Thanksgiving Monday. As opposed to many other post-secondary institutions that have up to a full week off per semester. The idea of putting a fall break in place here at Nate has been discussed and debated for years. Nate's a member Brenda Needham says it's the first thing that she brings up in meetings. I believe that it affects the students' uh, well-being, so actually it's one of my goals to advocate for. The idea of a fall break has the support of many staff and students, including network engineering student Quinn, who believes a break would be beneficial for students' mental well-being. Uh, it, it would be helpful to have a breather now and then. It, it's a lot of work. Although there are many in favor of the idea of a fall break, there are some who aren't so sure. Nate instructor Stuart Saraduk believes a fall break would not be beneficial and would in fact create some challenges. It, it stops the momentum of the learning that's taking place and then when, when students get back it takes a while for them to get back up to speed. I mean we have a hard enough time when we come back in September and students generally have forgotten a lot of things from the spring because they've just had four months off. There is a group at Nate currently looking at options to try and find what best meets students' needs. However, Nate representatives say that there are a lot of complexities involved, such as student loans, funding, scheduling, and staffing. As of right now, there are no set plans to put a break in the fall semester. However, it is a topic that is commonly discussed, so there's always that possibility of one in the future. Libby, how can students get involved and express their opinion on the matter? Well, they can talk to NATSA representatives, such as Brenda Needham, the VP Academic, and express whether or not they think a fall break would be a good idea. The NATSA office is located in room E131, or they can email NATSA at asknatsa at nate.ca. Libby, I'm sure anyone would love to have a few days off from work and school, so why is it important for NATE to provide a fall break? Well, November is one of the toughest months for students' mental well-being. It's leading up to the stress of Christmas and just coming out of the stress of midterms. Also, suicide rates of students have gone up over the past few years, so it could be beneficial to give students a break. Thanks, Libby. That's our Libby Dirks reporting live from the South Lobby. You're watching Nate News Watch, the next generation of news. This Remembrance Day marks the 100-year anniversary of the end of the First World War. On Sunday, people across Canada will be attending ceremonies to honour those who served. Students around Edmonton already took part in a touching service earlier this week. With more on how Edmonton is remembering, here's our Eric Bay. Thanks, guys. From outside of the Butter Dome, where the largest Remembrance Day service in Edmonton will take place on Sunday. It's one of the many ceremonies to honour the men and women who served our country. Earlier this week, students were part of a special service where they placed policies on the graves of soldiers across Edmonton. Hundreds of students braved the chilly weather in Edmonton on Monday to honour lives lost for No Stone Left Alone, an event where children across Canada place poppies on the headstones of Canadian soldiers to ensure their sacrifice is never forgotten. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. This year's ceremony had added significance as it is the 100-year anniversary of the armistice, which officially ended World War I. Over the course of the war, our country sent 60 
650,000, 650,000 men and women to fight. One in 10 did not return. No Stone Left Alone was started in 2011, right here in Edmonton. The goal of the foundation is to have a poppy placed on the grave of every soldier in Canada so that none are forgotten. In seven years, the event has expanded to 55 communities across the country and the service is also held in Poland, with close to 9,000 students taking part this year, showing them the importance of remembering. I think it's nice to remember the people who fought for us in the wars. They're an inspiration. The No Stone Left Alone Memorial Foundation is continuing to accept donations on their website. As for Remembrance Day, people are asked to arrive no later than 10 a.m. for the service held here at the Butter Dome. There will also be a ceremony at City Hall starting at 10.15 a.m. and another one at the Legislature featuring a 21-gun salute. Back to you guys. Thanks, Eric. That's Eric Bay reporting from the Butter Dome. Another Remembrance Day ceremony took place at the Alberta Legislature. Veterans, active servicemen, government members and others wishing to pay their respects came together on Thursday to remember the men and women who have fought and continue to fight for our country. For me personally, uh, I reflect back on my colleagues and soldiers that I've served with that, uh, that did lose their lives in conflict. And uh, I think about uh, their families uh, and the effect this, that it has on us as a country. The ceremony also honoured Indigenous veterans as November 8th is Aboriginal Veterans Day in Canada. Some tattoo artists in our area are using their talents to help soldiers. The Bearskin Arts Tattoo Studio may be your typical tattoo shop, but from November 3rd through November 10th, you can get their permanent mark from artists across Alberta and BC with the money going to XSK9 a nonprofit organization that pairs combat veterans with service dogs. The founder of XSK9, Bear Lamont, hopes that this will help especially those suffering from PTSD and TBI. Psychological support, mental health support, as well as utilizing them for mobility reasons. Um, a lot of service dogs also perform actual medical tasks, and those other tasks could be anything from alerting to medications and timing for medications, and that dog can help them either cope with the environment or get them out of that environment. Lamont says that the organization is in its beginning stages. If you're not interested in getting a tattoo but still want to contribute to the cause, you can donate to their GoFundMe campaign. Edmonton now has a new top cop. I believe diversity and inclusion are our strengths and I look forward to utilizing these strengths in helping building and keeping communities safe. Those were just a few words from Edmonton's well, incoming police chief, Dale McPhee, the 23rd man to fulfill the role, replacing Chief Rod Connect. McPhee recently well, served as the Prince Albert police chief for eight years and helped lead their police service to become the most culturally representative in Canada. I want to make sure that we include that diversity isn't just race, it isn't just gender, it's thinking and it's all of the above. We need to be diverse right across the system so we actually reflect the population but also reflect what the solutions are and so that's what I tend to uh, obviously learn more about. The St. Albert native is slated to begin in his role on February 1st, 2019. McPhee has been given a five-year contract with EPS. Prices for homes are decreasing, but so are the numbers of houses being bought. The average prices for residential homes have decreased by 3% in the last year, with residential unit sales decreasing over 13%. The Realtors Association of Edmonton believes that one of the reasons there is a downward pressure right now is because there are a lot of homes listed. Buyers uh, have a lot of choice, so there's a lot of opportunity to buy whatever it is that you want. Sometimes with that choice comes your tentative and you're not sure exactly what you want to do. So being decisive is difficult, but there is lots of choice out there. Torium says that buying a property is a long-term investment, but believes that now is a good time to make those first steps. Many of Alberta's ranchers are gathering at the Edmonton Expo for one of Canada's top agricultural shows. The 45th annual Farm Fair International event is taking place this week with more than 280 exhibitors and over 900 animals on display. 
Event coordinators believe that by connecting people from around the world, they can help build a global community while building awareness and creating growth for this industry. Um, it's a really, really important show uh, and event for the agriculture industry. There is a lot of business development and sales that happen here for our purebred livestock breeders. Farm Fair International runs until Sunday. For more information or to purchase your tickets, go online to farmfairinternational.com. Edmonton hosted a member of the royal family this week to help unveil the Edmonton River Valley tribute to the Queen. Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. Many of Alberta's community leaders gathered at the Government House on Tuesday evening to witness Lieutenant Governor Lois Mitchell alongside Her Royal Highness Princess Anne to announce a Commonwealth walkway for the city. The Secretary General of the Commonwealth says it was the Queen's idea to dedicate parts of the countries to enable them to make a contribution to keeping the climate the way we like it to be. She had come up with this brilliant idea of having a Queen's canopy so that a part of every single one of the 53 countries would be dedicated to making our environment better. The route for the walkway will travel along existing paths and will be developed in the coming months. The walkway could be open as early as next summer. The Cross Cancer Institute is celebrating half a century here in Edmonton. The Kai Edmonton Clinic was packed on Tuesday with the Cross Cancer Institute marking their 50th anniversary this week. Patients, volunteers, doctors and caregivers all came together including Alberta Minister of Seniors and Housing Lori Sigurdsson who was recently diagnosed with leukemia. She spoke on the optimism behind the anniversary event. It's been life changing for so many to be able to come to the cross, receive treatment and just the significant advances in research to really find a cure for cancer is so exciting. The Cross Cancer Institute treated more than 21,000 patients just last year. Some local gamers are resting their thumbs after a marathon gaming session that raised thousands of dollars for sick children in our city. Oh, no, no. Yeah, let's go! Overtime winner! Yeah, yeah, yeah! That's Skylar Jepson owning his dad on NHL 19. Luckily, they weren't on that center stage in the Edmonton Extra Life 24-hour charity event. They, along with hundreds of gamers, gathered at West Edmonton Mall for this 24-hour gaming session, raising over $70,000 for the Stollery Children's Hospital. The money goes to kids like Skylar, who ha who's had multiple spine surgeries. I'm feeling pretty good just to play some games and just give back to the story that has done so much for me and I feel that it's something that I love to do and that's the reason I come out here just to help kids like me. This is the seventh year for the event with gamers playing all over northern Alberta. In total close to a million dollars has been raised. Coming up after the break we explore why young men are more at risk for testicular cancer than they may think and how Nate is helping to remind the younger generation to, to check themselves. Anytime that you feel anything abnormal, any lump that is not normal, you need to get that reported. This week on Nate Newswatch, we brave the cold to bring you updates on your high school football. We also take a look at the end of the year for the Edmonton Eskimos, and we look at the Ooks volleyball team start of the year, and a new Ninja Warrior style gym opening up at Kingsway Mall. Make sure you stay tuned. As you can see, it's raining all around me. The ground is very wet and slippery right now. It's most likely going to get worse as we move into the weekend. This is all going to freeze. It's going to be very slick on the sidewalks and on the roads. So be careful out there. We'll have all that and more coming up on Newswatch. So the UK has just instituted the toughest ban on ivory trade Europe has ever seen.
So Ivana, we've had some pretty cool days this week, freezing rain this morning. It's hard to believe that we're still in fall. It feels a lot like winter time or spring, almost like a combination of the two. I know I am not a fan of the cold weather, but I did hear the weather's going to get better. Chance, what do you have for us? Well, guys, that's right. It has been fairly cold lately. It definitely feels a bit more like winter than fall. I have some good news coming up, I promise. But first, we'll go through some other cities. First up is Calgary. So going, going into the weekend, they're going to be mostly cloudy. They're going to see a morning low of minus three and afternoon high of zero. So not too bad on that front. 60% chance of snow, so not bad. Moving on to Jasper, they're going to be partly cloudy as well with a 30% chance of precipitation. Uh, they're going to have a morning low of minus six and afternoon high of three, which is not terrible. It will get a little bit colder for them going into Sunday, but it'll only get as low as minus eight, so not unbearable. Moving on to Fort McMurray on Saturday, they're going to have they're going to be mostly cloudy with a few sunny breaks. It will be quite cold, though. As you can see, they're going to have a low of minus 13 with a high of minus seven. Not very bright. It's going to get even colder on Sunday, getting as low as minus 16. So that's unfortunate. I do feel bad for anyone in Fort McMurray right now. Moving on to our own city of Edmonton, it's going to be a mix of sun and cloud on Saturday uh, with the temperature falling throughout the day. It'll get to about minus five, most likely 30% chance of precipitation. We may get uh, one to three inches or one to three centimeters rather of snow. Not terrible. Nothing we can't deal with. Uh, on Sunday, it's going to get pretty cold, getting as low as minus 12. During the week, it will probably warm up a little bit, however. Uh, so the averages for this time of year, usually about one degree high, minus eight degree low, which is where that's about where we are at the moment. The record high was set in 2005 at 17 degrees, which is very unseasonable. The record low was minus 30 in 1940. Very glad we are not there right now. That is unbelievably cold. So at least we can be glad we're not there yet. Back to you guys. Newswatch Weather is brought to you by NR92, the station for the students. Thanks, Chance. Men are getting hit where it hurts the most, and young men are most at risk. That's why nursing students from McEwen are visiting post-secondary schools educating students about testicular cancer. Ferda Salatan reports. Testicular cancer. It doesn't have the same ring tone as, say, breast cancer. Christine Bannerman, supervisor over at Nate Health Services, agrees that there is a stigma attached to this type of cancer. It seems it's kind of weird how uh, breast cancer we were not afraid to talk about, but testicular cancer, it's a little. And testicular cancer is a young man's disease. But now that November is in full swing, she believes that it's a good reminder for men. The folks in the month of November will start doing their checks again and then it'll fade off. But how do you check for testicular cancer anyways? It actually says, shower will get your nuts in the mood, okay? And then uh, you roll one nut between your fingers, between your finger and your thumb, and you're checking for lumps and bumps. Uh, so testicular cancer is most common cancer in males uh, age 15 to 39, and about uh, 1,000 males in Canada are diagnosed every single year. Ashley Pike is a third-year nursing student over at McEwen. This week, as part of November, she and her colleague, Julie Brell, set up a booth here at Nate where they hope to educate these young men all about testicular cancer in a very intimate way. Not the most accurate depiction, but they believe it gets the message across on how tumors in your testicles can feel like. And if you happen to feel something very similar like the models used in your very own testicles, it's a small tumor that's probably a stage one cancer, and that can be treated um, with removal, usually removal of the testicle. If they can, they'll treat it uh, with chemo and radiation. So stage two type cancer, it's getting into the lymph node, uh, lymph glands, but not any further. Stage threes, it's maybe huge, and it's actually gone into the lymph glands, and then potentially into other organs such as the lungs. And usually when it metastasizes, when it's gone to other areas of the body, the rate is not good. If you wish to know more about testicular cancer, you can head on over to Movember.com. For us, Alitan, Nate Newswatch. We have lots of action happening all over in sports. Jake, what's going on? Tonight is the Edmonton High School Senior Football Championships, featuring a showdown between the Salisbury Sabres and Harry Ainley Titans. 
The Titans team spent the week out in the cold on the field preparing for the championship game. The contest between the Sabres and Titans will be a rematch of the game earlier this year, which Harry Ainley won 26-10 all the way back on October 12th. Yeah, you know, I, I think our guys are uh, excited for the game. It's a, a city final, and, and that brings with it a certain amount of excitement. But uh, they're, as, they're as ready as uh, any other week. The game takes place tonight, 7.30 p.m. at Commonwealth Stadium. With the team officially eliminated from playoff contention, the Edmonton Eskimos cleared out their locker room and spoke to the media for one last time this season. 16 out of our 18 games, we had chances to win in the fourth quarter. We won nine of those games, and the other ones we didn't. And I think when it comes down to it, you know, we didn't make it happen at, at the right moments um, of games. And that's generally how football works. So, you know, this, this league is very competitive, and it comes down to a couple plays here and there. And, you know, the teams that are in the playoffs made more of those than the guys who aren't. Playoffs start this Sunday as the BC Lions cross over to the east and take on the Hamilton Tiger Cats with an 11 a.m. kickoff and at 2.30 when the Winnipeg Blue Bombers match up with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The first few games of the season have not gone as expected for the Nate Ooks women's volleyball team. The team has started the season losing their first six games in a row, winning only four of 22 sets thus far. This season has to be seen as a major disappointment for a team that started last year with four straight wins and features a roster with only three first-year players. Head coach Benj Heinrichs had this to say about the team's subpar start. Yeah, absolutely. We, we haven't been as good offensively as we need to be. So the, the connection between um, putting up a good pass, which we've been doing, and then getting a quality set and, and having our hitters put the ball away. So that's the, the biggest area. We're serving and passing really well, which in volleyball fundamentally is the most important thing. So uh, if we can add those other things and uh, get a little better on an offense, then we'll be in good shape. The women will have a chance to get their season back on track this weekend as they play back-to-back -back games against the University of Alberta Augustana Campus Vikings. A new Ninja Warrior style gym has opened up at Kingsway Mall. Fitset Ninja Warrior is Canada's largest indoor obstacle course. The recently opened gym features a 50,000 square foot full-sized obstacle course, a smaller kids course, fitness classes, as well as axe throwing and a rage room. Well, I've started to realize that there's a massive community of obstacle course racers in, in Edmonton and in Alberta. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to bring an obstacle course indoors in the wintertime? And through our partners, Core.Fit in Calgary and Kingsway Mall, we were able to secure it and make it happen. If you want to stop by and take a run at the course or take one of the fitness classes, it will only cost you $20. And there's no limit to how long you can stay. For more information on what Fitset offers, you can go to fitset.ca. Now let's take a look at everything going on in the pros. Time for your sports in 45. Wednesday night, the Toronto Raptors beat the Sacramento Kings 114 to 105, bringing their record to a league best 11 wins and one loss. Toronto will have a chance to pick up win number 12 tomorrow against the 4 and 8 New York Knicks. In hockey news, Pittsburgh Penguins star Evgeny Malkin has avoided a suspension after throwing a dangerous hit to the head of Washington Capitals player TJ Oshie in Wednesday night's 2-1 loss. And Chicago has fired longtime head coach Joel Quenville. Coach Q was the NHL's longest tenured bench boss and has led Chicago to three Stanley Cups, including the first championship since 1961. And the UFC has decided to dissolve the men's 125-pound division as early as 2019, and they have already begun releasing fighters in that weight class from their contracts. That's been your sports in 45. So, Jake, that fifth set Ninja Warrior Gym looked really cool. Did you uh, get a chance to take part in the obstacle course there? Well, I didn't get a chance to run any obstacles myself, but it looks so cool, and it's definitely something I'm looking forward to doing eventually. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Maybe we can go check it out after. I think that'd be a great idea. It's right across the street from us here at Nate. It's over at Kingsway Mall. It's open there until the end of January. Awesome. Perfect. Right Thanks, for my Jake. birthday. Coming up after the break, a store that makes home improvement affordable. We'll take a look inside the Habitat for Humanity Restore, which provides affordable furniture and building supplies to those in need. We are known well for building materials, but we also take uh, furniture and... 
Hey, you there. We know you're on your phone. So are we. NR92, everywhere you are. We should talk, snap, and tweet some more. With you, wherever you go. NR92.com, the station for the students. Newswatch jackets provided by Elite Promotional Marketing and Timberland Supply. While many places may be collecting food and clothing donations, one local charity is offering a unique shopping experience for those looking to add something new to their homes. Buying building supplies and furniture may not be your go-to shopping trip, but it could help make a difference when you shop. Habitat for Humanity Restores are home and building supply stores that accept and resell new and gently used building materials at a discounted price. Consumers can find items such as doors, paint, furniture, and appliances. The funds they receive from these items are put towards funding local Habitat for Humanity building projects. The piece of uh, the selling in the store and taking uh, donations is, is one piece. The other is that we're keeping things out of the landfill. We're taking items that are another retail place has not found a way to sell and we are finding uh, that buyer that is not typical by offering them the product at a lot uh, less uh, cost. Restores accept donations from the general public and businesses. For more information on how you can donate, volunteer, or to find a Restore near you, go online to their website, hfh.org. Well, Drew, the 100th Remembrance Day is on Sunday. Got any plans? Yeah, apparently there are a few plays going on this weekend, and I might go check one out. Bryn, what's going on in entertainment? All right, thanks Drew and Ivina. And yes, Drew, there are actually three plays going on, and I've got one for, if you want, each night of the weekend. The first one had its world premiere just this week to honor the 100th anniversary of Remembrance Day. It's a comedy that takes place in World War I Europe. Woo! Woo! It's called The Comedy Company, and it follows a true story of the Princess Patricia Light Infantry Division from Edmonton, who made comedy sketches to improve the morale of troops. Their commander, Major Adamson, plucked five guys out of the uh, line and said, you boys are going to put on a show for the troops. And they were like, what? <laughs> Adamson was a pretty radical guy, but he was the first guy to realize that the troops needed a little break from the ongoing madness that they were involved in. The Comedy Company has a 100% local cast and it's running at the Varscona Theatre daily until Remembrance Day. Edmonton's own Top 40 Under 40 is celebrating its 10th anniversary. You know, to make an impact on other people out there and, and to receive a a word like this as a result um, is huge for me. I, I grew up That's Emmett Hartfield right there, and there are 39 others like him. The Winspear Center filled up Wednesday evening to honor them. They're all Edmontonians who made an impact in their community, in and out of their work life. It's not just a job to them, whatever they do. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's more of, you know, a mission um, to, to really contribute to the city 24-7. People can be nominated by their peers and co-workers, and then every year, Avenue Magazine chooses 40 of them to be recognized at this gala. They get a chance to network, and I've heard it looks pretty good on a resume. A new play in Edmonton takes audience participation to the next level. I read in newspaper ads that they're needing skilled workers. This is a pretty cool one. Viscosity is what it's called, and it follows the stories of real-life oil workers, and the dialogue is verbatim the words of actual interviews. Right now, the actors are talking to thin air. It looks a little strange. But during showtime, you can walk up to them, and they will start talking to you. Melissa Thingolstad is an actress in Viscosity, and she doesn't even call it a play. It's more of a visit into a gallery space almost, where you're going to come in and uh, you're going to travel through the different spaces that these, that are kind of installations of the small worlds that these workers live in. Some people will become the receiver, which means you're going to walk to, like, say, that table, and there's going to be an X on the chair, and you're going to sit down on that chair, and then the person who's sitting at that table that is the actor will start to tell you their story. Viscosity opened on Wednesday, and it's running all throughout next week as well. You can see it daily at the Fringes Backstage Theatre. 
And with Remembrance Day on Sunday, I wanted to quickly mention a play happening at the Citadel. This is the third one. It's called Red Patch, and it's about the First Nations' involvement in World War I. It's to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Armistice, and it's running at the McLeod Theatre until Remembrance Day. And that's all for entertainment. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. I'm going to pass it back to Drew and Ivina. Thank you, Bryn, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Newswatch. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Have a good weekend.